This morning I want to share with you a very simple lesson. It's funny that the title is as simple as ABC. You know, when we think about life, too often times in the back of my mind, life becomes complicated. You're going to have to keep pushing the button this morning. Life seems complicated. And when I think about life being complicated, let us understand that life is complicated only because we overcomplicate it. Life is not that hard to live in the right way. Let us think of some tasks that we might change. For example, I'm going to use changing a light bulb. If you happen to look up, you'll notice there are two light bulbs above me on the spotlights that are out. Brethren, how hard is it for us to be able to change those light bulbs? Should that not be a relatively easy thing for us to do? But yet, we tend to complicate, and so as we complicate changing the light bulbs, we delay putting, we delay performing the task that needs to be done. And we do that in all aspects of our life. I, I agree, the lights that are above me are not that important, so we don't need to rush to change them, okay? <laughs> but we would complicate that in some ways. And so as I think about complicating that, I think about television advertisers. And many years ago, you'll remember the Geico commercial on television. Now it's, did you know you could save 15%? And then, but did you know that when a tree falls in the forest, it does make a noise? Or one of those other humorous commercials. But several years ago, Geico Insurance talked about the ability to save money. It was so easy that a caveman could do it. And if finally, I believe those ads became insulting to the intelligence of people, and that's why they pulled them off. But advertisers have caught on to the fact that we as consumers want to see things that are simple for us to be able to understand. And so as I think about those things, there is nothing new or exclusive to our society about that. Go back, if you will, to 2 Kings chapter 5. And I'm not going to read this whole passage to you, but it deals with Naaman. You'll remember him. He was the one who was a great ruler who had leprosy. And the servant of God came and said, You need to go and dip seven times in the Jordan River. Is that not a simple task for him to do? Yes. But what did Naaman say? David said, well, you know, the rivers here in our home country, they're so much greater than that nasty, filthy Jordan River. And so, remember, the servant came along and he reasoned with Naaman and said, now, now, Naaman, you know if the man of God had come and had asked you to do some great work, what would you have done? Would you have done it? And Naaman, in a rhetorical question, would have absolutely, positively had to say, yes, I would have done that. And so the servant says, basically, go to the Jordan and follow the easy, simple command that the man has given you. And when he did, what happened? Immediately his leprosy was gone. You see, for us today, God has made every effort to keep His Word and following His Word simple. As a matter of fact, the translation that you have in your hand, whether it's King James, New King James, American Standard, English Standard, they are all written where a sixth grade education could understand them. That's pretty simple, brethren. That's pretty simple for us to understand. And so, this morning, I want to share with you an A, a B, and a C that deal with the simplicity of what God's Word says. First of all, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 tells us that all have sinned. 
all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No matter how we slice it or how we dice it, we cannot get around the fact that everyone in life who has lived, who is living, and who will live unless they die as a child of an unaccountable age, we know the old saying is true that nobody is perfect. Amen. And so when I think about this aspect that nobody is perfect, I have to think in the back of my mind that part of our problem in our society today, and it is tr just as true today as it was 200, 300, 2,000 years ago. Our biggest problem is that no one wants to admit to being wrong. That's right. Nobody wants to say the words that David said. I have sinned. That's right. Why is it that we feel that we don't need to admit our sin? We all are going to fall short of what God wants us to be. As a matter of fact, Scripture paints for us a totally different picture of that attitude. When I turn to the book of 1 John chapter 5, and, or excuse me, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 down through verse 10. Notice what John records for us through inspiration. He says, this is the message which we have heard from him. Who is the him? John says, this is what Jesus has revealed to us. And we declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. Now catch this next verse real close. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Brethren, let me put that in today's language. We're lying to ourselves. Yep. We're telling ourselves a falsehood when we say we have no sin. And when we say those words, he goes on in that verse and he says, and the truth is not in us. You see what he says? When I say I have no sin and the truth is not in me, guess what? That means I'm what? Liar. I'm lost. I'm a liar. And we know according to Revelation chapter 21 that all liars will have what? Their part in the Amen. lake of fire. Brethren, let us understand that when we say we have no sin, we're lost. We're doomed to an eternity of hellfire and brimstone. But I'm thankful that John added verse 9 in here. Notice what it says. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, notice what we do to Jesus. We make Him a liar. We make Him a liar and His Word is not in us. Do you think John wants us to understand that if we say we have no sin, that we're lost? John wants us to know that we have sinned and we need to make acknowledgement of that sin. Or then you look at what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. The wages of sin is what? It's death. The wages of sin is death. If I continue in sin... I have no hope. But brethren, let's also see this morning that there is no doubt that the world needs a Savior. And I talk about the world needing a Savior. Maybe we should make that a little more personal. There's no doubt that I, that I need a Savior. But, 
due to the fact that all have sinned, the letter B, and that is, behold, the Lamb of God. And as I think about the Lamb of God from John chapter 1 and verse 29, there in that passage where the next day John saw Jesus approaching him, he uttered the word, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John acknowledged Jesus as the Savior that the world needed. And so when I look and I think about the Savior coming, the Lamb of God, it just magnifies the need that we have for the Savior. And when I think about the need and the magnifying of that need for the Savior, let's understand how is it accomplished that the Savior has come for us if you go to Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 26, there in Hebrews chapter 9 in verse 26, the Hebrew writer tells us that he would often have had to suffer since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared, notice what it says, to put away sin by his sacrifice, or the sacrifice of himself. Or we could go back to Matthew chapter 26 and we could look at verse 26. There is Jesus is in the upper room instituting the Lord's Supper. When he tells them to take of the cup, he says, you take of this cup because it is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sin. The Savior has come to take away the sin of the world. And how does He do it? He does it because and by the <laughs> shedding of His blood. His blood was shed for us. Paul also records that same thought in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25. But to go on and to answer the question of how is it accomplished? I want to go back to some simple principles. I want to share with you the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some may sit there and say, but Brother Ray, I've been a Christian for 30 years. I don't care. You still need to know the message of how to become a Christian. Because it is all of our responsibility to go and to share the message with a world that's seeking a Savior. And so as I begin to think, first of all, we must hear the Word. And when I think of hearing the Word, I go back into the passage there in Matthew 17 and verse 5, where God speaks the words about His Son. Hear ye Him. We must hear what Jesus has to say about how you can come and accomplish salvation. How you can come and become one who is in a saved state. First of all, Jesus says that we must believe. When I think about the fact of believing... Jesus himself in John chapter 8 and verse 24, except ye believe that I am he. What does he say? What's the last part? We know the first part, right? The last part says, except ye believe that I am he, ye shall die. Oh, wait, wait, no. Somebody said in your sins? Is that what somebody repeated? Well, wait a minute. We're too proud to admit we have sinned. Oh, wait a minute. Jesus says, you better believe that I'm the one who's come or you're going to die in the sin that you deny you had. This is also confirmed to us in His words in Matthew 7, 21. 
or one of my favorite passages in Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. But you must believe, number one, that He is. And secondly, you must believe that He is a rewarder of them. I've got to believe that He exists, and I'm going to believe that He is going to reward the one who hears and obeys the Word of God. I believe. But what about thirdly here? How about repent of sin that's in your life? Again, the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 5. What does Jesus say? Except ye repent, you will, what does it say? Perish. If I'm not willing to repent and change the way I live life, Jesus says I'm going to perish. We see that also confirmed later on as the church is established in Acts chapter 2, don't we? When those who had crucified the Son of God, excuse me, when those who murdered the very Savior who came to save them, in Acts 2 it says when they were pricked in their hearts, they asked, those men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said what? Repent. Repent and be baptized. For what? Why do you need to repent? Why did you need to be baptized? For the remission of your sins. We'll come to that phrase, remission of sins, in a moment. But all throughout the book of Acts, we see repentance. But what about number five? How about confessing Jesus? Confessing His name. You remember what He says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32 and verse 33? Where He says, The one who will confess Me before men, Him will I what? Confess before My Father who is in heaven. <coughs> no confessing who Jesus is before those of your peer group. Jesus says, no confession of you before the God of heaven, my Father. And brethren, let's understand about confession. I know that last week as Brother Gordon came and he was added to the church, I asked him that question. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, to which he affirmatively, affirmatively responded yes? That's a one-time confession there, right? But I believe the confession Jesus is talking about, about confessing Him is a confession that is made every single day we live life. It is how we portray ourselves before those who are still in the world. But number six, when I think for the one who has never become a Christian, I realize that I must be baptized. I must be baptized for the express purpose of having my sins remitted. When I go into the watery grave of baptism, it is there that I contact the blood of Christ and my sins are taken away. Not before that time and not after that time. It is at that very moment that I am baptized into the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ that my sins are taken away. Jesus tells us to be baptized in Mark 16, does he not? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 2.38, the same passage that says we need to repent, it says that we need to be baptized so our sins can be taken away. That's how you become a Christian. That's as simple as I can make it, taking the words of Jesus and telling one how to become a Christian. That's right. Why does man complicate that? Someone want to answer, why, why does man have to complicate that? And they try to complicate each one of these steps, if you will, to salvation. But I'm not done talking about 
what one must do to accomplish applying the blood of Christ because we also need to deal with one who is a Christian. Because I know that I can sin against God after I am baptized in Christ. Amen. I know that I can fall back into the way of the world. Many of us, me included, have done exactly that. And we've done the things that I'm going to talk about now to make sure that our life is right in the sight of God. First of all, we must, again, come with a penitent heart, the attitude of repentance, that desire to change again, to leave the way of the world, and again to walk in the light of God. And we must pray. You remember Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer. He had the strong desire to have the power of the Holy Spirit. Brethren, when I, I don't think there's anything wrong with him having the desire to have the Holy Spirit. Nothing wrong with that. But it was his reasoning for wanting that power. He wanted to use that power so that he might increase his wealth. It was all about his attitude of the Holy Spirit and about the Holy Spirit that caused him to sin. And you remember... He was told that he was going to perish. And that certain things were going to happen to him. And what did he do? He repented. And he said to those, please pray that that doesn't happen to me. We as brethren have responsibility. When one comes repenting of sin, we have, a, a, I say responsibility, let me, read, let me change that word. We have an obligation to pray for our brother or our sister. We have a responsibility to encourage them that they might continue living the life that God wants them to live. It's an obligation. But not only do I need to have repentance and prayer, I need to show forth fruits of my repentance. You know, oftentimes we go to other passages, but I want you to turn to the book of Luke this morning. And I want you to look at Luke chapter 3. And I, I'm not going to read all these verses to you. But in Luke chapter 3, the words of Jesus ring out loudly. There, beginning in verse 7. It says, Then he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Notice what the next verse says. Therefore, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Don't rely on your own opinions. You show fruits worthy of repentance. You show by your action that you truly have changed. That's what Jesus says. <clears throat> Jesus says that we must do that. And then as we've already read in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, we know that we must walk in the light. Brethren, as long as you and I are continuously striving to do right, walk in the light, God is faithful and just to forgive us. That's called grace, by the way. That's grace. God will forgive us of things that maybe we are unaware of that we do that are wrong. But I know when I know that I've done something wrong, I know I've got to come and make confession and repent of those sins. But then lastly here, I've got to continually confess. I've got to continually admit that I have sinned in my life. None of us will ever be perfect. We're walking a walk towards perfection. The only time that we will be perfected is when the Lord comes again and He says, Enter in. At that time, I will be perfected. But until that time, I must continue 
to walk in the light. And then I go back to Hebrews chapter 2, and I look at verse 1 through verse 4. As I think about the Lamb of God, where the Hebrew writer says that we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through the angels prove steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience receive a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Brother, salvation began to be spoken of of Jesus in his earthly ministry. He passed that on to faithful men who passed it on from generation to generation to generation. And we have the same words. How are we going to escape if we neglect those words? How are we going to escape if we neglect what the Lamb has come to accomplish. And then last this morning, the letter C, come unto me. And that comes from our passage that Brother Charlie read for us. And as I look at that passage, there are four things in this invitation that Jesus gives. When I first look and see that He says, for me, there is something to do. Right? He says, come that requires me to do something. But secondly, there is also something for me to take. And that is His yoke. It is a yoke that is easy. It is a yoke that Jesus will help us bear. But thirdly, there is also something to leave. What am I got to leave? When Jesus says, come unto me, he says, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. Jesus says, you leave your weariness, you leave your labors, you leave your burdens when you come to me. And then lastly, when I think about something, there is something that I need to find. And brethren, you know what you find? you find the rest that Jesus has promised you. So this morning as I think about this lesson as we bring it to a close, I look out into our world today and I see thousands that are lost and dying every single day. And the reason that they're lost and they're dying is because they think that religion is too complicated. I've just shown you what true religion is this morning. And I've shown you that it's not complicated. And so as I think about that, I think about folks in the church today. I think about folks who say, I just don't know enough to go and share the message with someone. Brethren, I just showed you how easy it was to share the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can do it if you want to do it. And so this morning, the only way you do it, keep it simple. Keep it simple. Make it where folks can understand. Hopefully this morning, if there is one in our assembly, that has not put Christ on in baptism. You've heard the word preached in a pure and simplistic manner. You know that you need, and you should be able to see, that you need to repent, that you need to confess, that you need to be baptized so your sins can be washed away. Jesus made it so simple for me to understand. Hopefully that there's one here this morning that needs to do that. You will come. As the Lord's invitation, He is standing before you this very moment, saying, Come unto me. Or do we have one in our audience who is a member of the body of Christ? And you need to come home. You need to acknowledge that sin is in your life. Repent of those sins. Confess those sins. Let your brother pray with you and pray for you. You know what your need is. Jesus says, Come. We ask you to do it right now while we stand.